In many ways, Max Licato needs no introduction. Best-selling author and writer, he's also the preaching pastor at Oak Hills Church in San Antonio, Texas. Stand by for the drawl. He's been part of my Christian life for most of the journey, and it really does match up because I know he's been writing for about 30 years. And I want to say, Max, I have been a defender of the proper pronunciation for your name <laughs> for all of that time. It's not Locato. It is Locato. That's right. It's a like joy tomato. To meet you in person. Oh, thank you, thank you. It's a treat. It's a treat to see you. What, oh, a, what a joy. I, okay, I have to do a little reminisce. Yeah, significance yeah. and and you know everyone who meets you tells you about a book or about a passage or some connection where you've ministered very profoundly into their lives. But um, this is the uh, Compass magazine from September 2006. Uh, some of you will remember this monthly magazine way back then. And the book we offered that month was a Max Licato treasure, Cure for the Common Life. Finding your sweet spot? Yeah. Finding mm -hmm. your sweet spot. That was the book being offered when I returned after 12 years away raising my children mm. to this daily program and mm. I was in my sweet spot. And in many ways, you managed to frame people's life experience with your wonderful words. I don't know that there's a better storyteller in Christendom today. Mm. Well, that's very kind, that's very kind. Now, what I can't wrap my head around is how many books you've written yeah. and still lived a life. <laughs> 80, 82 million books. <laughs> How My golf game that? is pretty terrible. <laughs> and, and let me get this right. Over 100 million pieces, products, that yeah. would include music. Yeah, projects. candle. Um, I, can't, uh, I started to say candles. I meant calendars, uh, you know, <laughs> devotional books. And yeah, I started, you know, quite a while ago. I think my first book came out in 80, 86, 85, 86. And, uh, and I've, I've been writing ever since. I started. Someone locked you away right there. And said, Just keep going. <laughs> it, it's been a joy, though. It really has. And I, I love to write. I, I do. There are parts of writing I don't like, just like everybody has something that they don't like. I don't really like the rewriting portions when my editors send the manuscript back and it's got red ink all over it. <laughs> I can't imagine but, a lot of but that. I, I, love, I love the idea that these books go where, where I'll never go, you know, and... Um, and they, the thing about books is that they, they go into someone's heart upon invitation. When, mm. when, when you sit down and read a book, you're basically saying to that author, come over, let's talk a little bit. You know, it's, it's kind of like saying, well, put the coffee on, turn the lamp on, sit at the couch and we'll talk. And so it's a very intimate uh, medium. Whereas radio or television, you, is. It, you know, you just might just happen to hear a program or you're changing channels all the time. But so I, I, think, I think writing will always have a place as a, as a comforting medium. I can't yeah. imagine what you haven't written about that we need to learn, but you've tackled uh, something I'm sure we've seen. We probably use this word a lot. Uh, why did you go for grace more than we deserve, greater than we imagine? Well, uh, this has kind of been a life message, Moira, for me. Uh, I, I, I just feel like we settle for wimpy grace. <laughs> I, 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 I think that uh, most Christians, uh, it's been a while since they were stunned by grace. Uh, grace isn't amazing to people as much as it should be and could be. I believe that non-Christians, non-believers, uh, if they could get the grace element, the, the, the joy of this grace, then they would understand. Grace is what separates Christianity from any other religion in the history of the world. In what way? Every other religion, every other philosophy says, you do something and maybe God will accept you. But grace says God has done it. He's accepted you. Now you accept him. It flip-flops it. And so to... to we live in a day uh, in which it's real popular just to say, you know, that all religions are the same. And I want to be very respectful of all religions, but I don't think it's right to, to miss this thing that's so unique and gorgeous and fascinating and astounding about, about what Jesus offers and promises. This is what captured the heart of Paul, I think. This is the reason the book of Romans is in the Bible. The reason the book of Galatians is in the Bible is because the apostle Paul never quite got over this whole idea of not only Jesus for us, but Jesus inside us. Oh, there you Him go. Him moving in 
and changing us from the inside out. This is, I mean, this is just unheard of. I've pulled one of your wonderful word pictures uh, that I want you to see. This, this is typical, Max Licato. Grace is God as heart surgeon, mm -hmm. cracking open your chest, removing your heart poisoned as it is with pride and pain and replacing it with his own. Am I right in saying Hudson Taylor, when he had his epiphany, he called this the exchanged life. Mm. Not I, but Christ. Mm. Major Ian Thomas, founder mm. of Cape and Marie Bible Schools, talked about rescuing missionaries on fields all over the world who were out there striving for God, not realizing that they needed to yield to the Christ life in them. This was a discovery you made, Matt. It is, it is. In the book, I, I talk about, I, I don't know how I missed this for so many years because, you know, the other prepositions, uh, Christ for me, with me, near me, I, I got those. But this whole idea of Christ in me. 216 times. 216 times Paul makes reference to this. And, and John makes reference to it, about, I think, about 26 times. And, and think about the statements of the Apostle Paul. One of them was, uh, it is no longer I who live but Christ who lives in me. Can you imagine getting to the point where you could say, you know, I, I don't think I'm alive anymore. Uh, it, it's Christ. It, everything inside of me is Christ. I, I'm loving with His love. I'm living with His energy. Forgiving. I'm, I'm forgiving with His forgiveness. His forgiveness. Uh, bigotry is gone. Uh, prejudice is gone. Regrets are gone. He comes in and He, this is what I talk, this is what, what I mean when I say that, that God is a heart surgeon. He takes the old heart out. Now, in the Bible, the heart is that word for the want to and the can do, the desire and the ability. And so, so what happens when we give our heart to Jesus, which is a phrase we use a lot, when we give our heart to Jesus, He returns the favor and He <laughs> places His heart inside of us. And this is the whole idea of, of following Christ. And that is that day by day, one degree of glory to the next, He's going to move in and change what we want to do and change what we can do. I heard someone once say, God changes our wanter. Yeah. <laughs> we start <laughs> to right. want new things. That's right. Now, for many people uh, who have uh, hopefully made the discovery that it's about a relationship, because yeah. that gets missed. Yeah. And the people sitting in pews on this Sunday who don't get that yet. But then they, they really have invited Jesus into their heart. But... They haven't done this. How do you move them into that gear where it's Christ living in them, Jesus living the Christian life in and through them? People don't need a new set of rules and regulations. We've got enough rules and regulations coming at us from all angles. And to think that Christianity is just in swapping one set of rules and regulations for another, it's not going to change anyone's life. Here's what people need to know. If you have given your heart to Jesus, he has given his heart to you period. It is happening. It is happening. So relax. <laughs> Take a deep breath. Trust Him. Stop striving. Mm. Just trust Him and begin to seek Him more than you seek work. Seek Him. Make it your goal every day to say, God, show me yourself. You illustrate this so beautifully as a Boy Scout. <laughs> with your yeah, badges, I was a Boy Scout. Uh, you, that kind of mentality. Yeah, getting the badges. Exactly. Uh, brownie points. Uh, right. Striving right. to to merit God's favor and even heaven. Mm. Well, in the in the book, I talk about how I, I was a young man when I uh, began trying to follow Christ, and and I was also a Boy Scout, and so it made sense to me that okay, Christianity is just God's version of Boy Scouts, and anybody who's been in Scouts knows that it's a merit-based system. They even call the badges merit badges, badges. right? So it's all merit-based. And you, you work your way up. You earn your way in. Everything is according to what you do. You send Morse code, you get the Morse code merit badge. You paddle across the, uh, the, the, the creek, you get canoe merit badge. So I thought, okay, now I'm, I'm a Christian, so I need to earn my merit badges. Here's the problem. The Bible doesn't tell me what the rules and regulations are. Nowhere in the Bible does it say, okay, you are required to attend this many church services, give this amount of money, uh, love this many jerks in your life. In, in order. It's just not there. But if I think it's there, 
and I go looking for it, I'm going to walk away, number one, frustrated because it's not there. Number two, fearful because it wasn't there. And I'm thinking I must have missed it. Mm -hmm. And then number three, guilt ridden because I'm going to live under the assumption that I've never done enough. And that, I think, is a description of many people who have found Christianity distasteful and burdensome. And my message to them is, wait, you're, you're, you need to understand that what Christ did for you and what Christ does for you is that He has done all the work. He's done all the work. A finished it's, work. It's a Calvary. finished work. It's a finished work. Your job is to trust it and live with Him. But He has done the work. And don't think for a second, don't think for a second that any work we do adds to the finished work of Christ. Let's go to the flip side of that, and you've alluded to it, Max, that not only do we have to do more to earn our salvation, but we're adopted into a family, and you say loud and clear, the adoption is irreversible. You don't believe you can lose it either. I don't. I don't. Why would God save us by grace and then tell us to stay saved by works? Mm. When he's done all the work. When he's done all the work. I've got friends who have adopted children. I, I'll, my three daughters are, are biological, but I've, you do too uh, have friends, I'm sure, who have adopted children. Mm -hmm. and, and I've watched them. Uh, you know, raising adopted children is not easy. And they come with their own unique set of problems and challenges. And I'm sure that my friends who have adopted children have probably wondered if they've done the right thing, you know. They may have had a regret here and there. But you know what? They don't send those kids back. Mm -hmm. They do not send those kids back. Those parents made a covenant to raise those kids. Now, I was a bio I have I have biological parents and, and really my dad didn't have a choice, you know. He couldn't hand me back to the hospital, you know. But uh, but biological parents, they have a choice. They could actually look at a child and say, "Hmm, I think I'll pass on that child, you know, but they don't, so they adopt that child. The Bible says that we have been adopted. This, I think this is a strong picture of, of the picture of grace, strong image of the picture of grace. God has adopted us. Now, if adoptive earthly parents don't give kids back, how much more? The perfect parent. The perfect parent, the heavenly father. Mm -hmm. He's not going to give us back. He's already seen our life from start to finish. He's known, he knows everything we've done. Most of all, he knows everything we're going to do. He knows our times of rebellion. He knows our times of hard-heartedness. If he adopts us, we're in. It, it, it doesn't depend upon me. It depends upon him. And I think grace says this. Trust God's grip on you more than you trust your grip on God. Mm -hmm. I pulled a scripture from your book. I like this. John 10, 28 in the Amplified. Jesus says, and I give them eternal life and they shall never lose it or perish throughout the ages to all eternity. They shall never by any means be destroyed and no one is able to snatch them out of my hand. That's pretty conclusive. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> well, if we live with the fear that, that we're going to fall away irreversibly, if we live with the fear that the next sin might do me in, uh, is that grace? Is well, that it's grace? not a yoke that is easy and a burden that is light. Absolutely. Sure. <laughs> if, if you think, if a person thinks that they can lose their salvation, then here's what happens. On a given day, they feel like they are saved and lost multiple times during the day. You know, they're saved at 9 a.m., but then they lose their temper and they're lost at 10 a.m. And then they're saved at 11 a.m. when they repent and then they're lost at 12. It just, it's this up and down, up and down, and they just hope against hope that they'll die on an upswing. That, it's that, performance based. It's performance like based. It's the merit cult based. members that come well, to my well, door. Well, it's legalism. It's, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a works based righteousness. And that's exactly what Jesus came to destroy, to put away the law. And that's exactly what the Apostle Paul was, uh, what motivated him to take up that pen and go back to the Galatians and say, how is it that you're so quickly going back to that from which you've been delivered? You know, this is a passionate part of our Christian faith. I think it makes sense for us as Christians to major in the grace of God. This is the most wonderful news. It's life changing. It's liberating. It's bondage breaking. It creates a new kind of person, 
the person who lives with the security of God, the affirmation of God, the blessing of God, and even more, the presence of God inside of them. And for us to take our Christian faith and to say, okay, the Lord saved me, but now it's up to me to stay saved. Mm -hmm. What hope is that? Well, as you say in the book, we're more confident about lasagna recipes <laughs> than the entrance requirements for heaven. That's right. So you want to settle us in this marvelous grace, and we don't take it for granted. Uh, we can grieve the Holy Spirit. And you're careful to remind us that uh, with this great uh, liberty comes responsibility, comes responsibility and great potential. Absolutely. And, and people always say, but if we overteach grace, won't somebody sin? Or if we really teach grace, won't somebody take advantage of it? And the answer to that is yes, they will for a while, for a while. But there's a parent on this case. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> Who said he'd finished the work he began. Absolutely. And this is, this is the risk God's willing to take with mm. us. Uh, here's, here's what happens, I think, is that uh, people uh, receive this wonderful grace and they say, okay, the Lord loves me. He's accepted me. Then I guess I can gossip and I can slander. I can do everything I want to do. And you know what? The Lord who lives inside that person's heart will prompt that person, will convict that person, will test that person, will uh, even uh, uh, punish that person to the point where they come back and they say, no, this isn't the way a child of God should behave. And grace becomes our teacher. This is Paul's term out of Titus chapter 2. Uh, grace becomes our teacher. It's our instructor. It leads us uh, in a way that we live actually a more godly life than that we would if we were trying to save ourselves. I think of Paul's words, the goodness of God leads us to repentance. Absolutely, absolutely. It changes us, it changes us. That's the only life worth living, Max. Oh my goodness. Isn't it? One of my favorite stories, if I used it years ago in a book, I can't remember which book, but it's a story about a lady who married poorly, married a man who was real harsh, gave her a list of rules and regulations every day. and. Uh, it was just terrible. She, he was abusive and, and uh, she literally had a list of chores that he expected her to do. That uh, marriage did not list. end. Yeah, that marriage did not end. Mm -hmm. That did not last. But she, um, she married a man then who was a wonderful, godly man. And one day in this good marriage, she came across that list of rules and that list of chores from that prior mess marriage. And she said to herself, I'm, I'm doing the chores still and no one has to tell me. When we're married to God, we end up working, absolutely. But, it's, but we don't have to be told. It, it, it's, a, it's that indwelling presence of Christ, and it's joyful, and it's fruitful, and it's, oh, it's grace. Well, this is such a privilege, and did we tell you? I'm sure we did. Max is here for three visits, so this is just the first one. And thank you, Max, for making this book available to our viewers an opportunity to strengthen the ministry at the same time. I'm gonna tell you John Ortberg, author and pastor writes, reading Max Licato on grace is like hearing Warren Buffett on money or Julia Child on food. It is a subject he has spent a lifetime falling in love with. You will love every page. Thank you for sending your best ministry gift to get your copy of Grace. More than we deserve, greater than we imagine. Wait till you read it. 1-800-265-3100. This is a limited time offer, so we hope you'll respond right away. You can go to crossroads.ca as well. Thank you so much. Thanks again, Max. Back tomorrow.